Welcome Revive Church. For those of you that have not been here, um, this is your first night here. You're in for a little bit something different. Normally I don't, I don't teach like I'm going to teach tonight, but if you've missed any of these classes and you're interested in watching them, you can get on YouTube and just type in my name, Shay Caffey, and you can watch lots of teachings. I have the entire book of Revelation amplified from the Greek, so you can catch lots of things on YouTube. But tonight, we're going to do the part five of our six-part series called The Race, and tonight we're going to learn how to finish well. So part one, we were making the team. We talked about the spiritual armor, what it is. Uh, part two was run your race, and we talked about things that could disqualify you. Um, part three was stay in your lane, and we talked about the spiritual gifts that the Lord has gifted us with and how to use those for the furtherance of the kingdom. Yes, uh, last week was part four, which was pass the baton. And we talked a lot about discipleship, what that looks like when you're discipling a younger Christian versus a more mature Christian. And then tonight is finish well. When I was coming home from Ohio um, on a trip in the airplane, I sat next to a lovely, she was, she was in her 70s. And we just got to chatting, and she was a Christian and a spirit-filled Christian. She was from Reston, Louisiana. So we were just talking about life, and she was a little bit down. She's got a lot of physical ailments that were happening to her, and she had been taking care of her husband, and he had recently passed away. And so she was just sharing that she had so much free time on her hands, she didn't know what to do with herself. She said, I feel like I'm floundering for purpose. She goes, because, you know, when you're a mom and you're raising your children, now my children are all grown and they're married and they have children of their own. She's like, and then it was my husband and he was, he had Alzheimer's. And so she's like, so I spent years just tending to him day after day. And she goes, and then he passed away this, this year. And she goes, and now I'm just like, what do I do? What do I do with my time? And, and she goes, and I just keep having so many physical ailments and she just said you know what I just I want to be used by the Lord so badly and I just feel like maybe this is it for me maybe maybe he's done with me she goes and then I heard the Lord say I called Moses when he was 80 she's like so maybe he does have something for me she just didn't know what it was and and I think that a lot of times people can go into depression if they don't have a purpose it's, everybody needs to find something that they feel like they are. there's a reason for it, that there's a reason that I'm here on this earth, I have a purpose. And so when you find that and you're passionate about that, um, just life just seems to work better because we're called for a purpose. We're called into the kingdom of God for a purpose, not just to go through life and deal with distractions and deal with, you know, we, we are here for a reason. So the main thing that we need to focus on right now is, is finishing well, because there's a lot of times in a race, you might not start off well. I don't know how many of you ran track, but some people get their kick closer to the end, and that's when they pass people. So it doesn't necessarily matter how you start. It's really depend how you finish, especially in this Christian walk. So Hebrews 10, I'm going to read a lot of scripture tonight. Um, Hebrews 10, 35 through 36, this is from the New Living, and it says, so do not throw away this confident trust in the Lord. Remember the great reward it brings you. Patient endurance is what you need right now so that you will continue to do God's will. And then you will receive all that he's promised. And so when I look up all these words in the Greek, the word that stood out was patient. Patient endurance is what you need right now. And the word patient says in the New Testament, the characteristic of a man who is unswerved from his deliberate purpose and his loyalty to faith and piety, which is righteousness, um, by even the greatest trials and sufferings. So we have to have that endurance, so that, those characteristics of righteousness and our deliberate purpose until the end so that we can receive the reward that God has for us because our, our walk is likened to a race. And so when we die, death on this earth, that's our finish line. Where we spend eternity is determined by how well we ran this race. So the, the finish is super important. So I'm going to start in Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. This is King James. And it says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight 
and the sin which doth so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. This phrase, the great cloud of witnesses, has been misinterpreted by just about everybody I've ever talked to. Because most people think the great cloud of witnesses is every Christian that's died before us that are up there watching us. They're the great cloud of witnesses watching us run our race. Well, I'm sorry, but that's creepy. Because <laughs> I'm a very modest person, and that is the last thing I want to think about is a bunch of people up there <laughs> watching me take a shower. I'm sorry. That is not what that, that verse means at all. And so I'm going to clear some things up tonight. This great cloud of witnesses that is um, addressed in Hebrews, the Vines Expository Bible Dictionary tells us exactly who they are and why they're called witnesses. And it's not everybody that's died before us as Christians up there watching us. So you don't have to worry about that. So here it is um, in the Vines Expository. The cloud of witnesses here of those mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11. Those whose lives and actions testified to the worth and the effect of faith and whose faith received witness in the scriptures. So the fact that they're called the great cloud doesn't mean it's a cumulonimbus. It means it is a, a multitude of people listed by name in Hebrews chapter 11. And the reason they're called witness is witnesses is because what they did was so worthy, noteworthy, that it was chronicled, it was documented in the scriptures for us. It was made witnessed to by putting it in the Bible. So we're going to find out in Hebrews chapter 11 who these people are and what they did that was so good that they made the hall of faith. Because a lot of times in Hebrews chapter 11, the, the caption says hall of faith. So these are our hall of faithers. Um, the first one that finished well enough to make the hall of faith that's mentioned is Abel. And so I'm just going to read a little bit about each of these people. So you're going to get a lot of history tonight on people in the Bible that finished well and enough about their stories that you realize why did they finish? Why did they make this hall of faith? Genesis 4, 1 through 8. This is the New Living Translation. Now Adam had sexual relations with his wife Eve, and she became pregnant. When she gave birth to Cain, she said, with the Lord's help, I produced a man. Can you imagine the first baby ever born to a female? I've made a man. She's produced a man. Later, she gave birth to his brother and named him Abel. When they grew up, Abel became a shepherd while Cain cultivated the ground. When it was time for the harvest, Cain presented some of his crops as a gift to the Lord. Abel also brought a gift, the best of the firstborn lambs from his flock. The Lord accepted Abel and his gift, but he did not accept Cain and his gift. This made Cain very angry, and he looked dejected. Why are you so angry? The Lord asked Cain. Why do you look so dejected? You will be accepted if you do what is right. But if you refuse to do what is right, then watch out. Sin is crouching at your door, eager to control you. But you must subdue it and be its master. One day Cain suggested to his brother, hey, let's go into the fields. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. I'm like, Abel made the Hall of Fame in his... <laughs> His life is chronicled in about mm, just a few verses. He was born. Um, he became a shepherd. He presented uh, an acceptable sacrifice, and he got murdered. And, and he made the hall of faith. So why did he make the hall of faith? Let's go to Hebrews chapter 11, 4, and see what they say. It was by faith that Abel brought a more acceptable offering to God than Cain did. Abel's offering gave evidence that he was a righteous man, and God showed his approval of his gift. Although Abel is long dead, he still speaks to us by his example of faith. So it was because, through faith, God must have expressed to these boys what an acceptable sacrifice would look like, because he did it throughout the Bible, telling people this is an acceptable sacrifice. Cain brought him some of the crops. He didn't bring him the first fruit. He brought him some. But Abel not only brought him a blood sacrifice, he brought him the best and the firstborn. And so 
through faith, Abel listened and obeyed. And what we're going to find out is these people that made the hall of faith, not only did they listen and have faith in God, but they obeyed him. And it was the combination of these things that got them into the hall of faith. In 1 John 3, 11 through 12, this is New Living Translation. It says, this is the message that you have heard from the beginning. We should love one another. We must not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and killed his brother. And why did he kill him? Because Cain had been doing what was evil, and his brother had been doing what was righteous. Well, when I look up the word righteous to see what righteous was, um, the Greek word says it's used of Old Testament characters noted for piety and probity. Well, I, I knew what piety was, but I didn't know what probity was, so I just looked them up. So piety means reverence towards God. It means righteousness. Um, but probity means, uh, probity would be more like integrity, like upright and honest. So this Abel, he was upright, he was honest, and he had reverence for God. So that's when you hear somebody that's righteous in the Old Testament, those are the three characteristics that would be descriptive of them. So Abel was the first man in the Bible to exhibit these characteristics. Uh, Adam failed <laughs> to listen and obey. Uh, Eve failed to listen and obey, and Cain failed to listen and obey. Well, Abel's next. So he's the first one that did something right, and he did it right enough that he made the hall of faith. So he started well, he finished well, and now we're going to move on to the number two guy listed in the hall of faith, and that would be Enoch. Well, Enoch made the hall of faith. He was the great, 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 great grandson of Adam through his son um, Seth. So Enoch, and most people know one thing about Enoch, and we'll get to that, but here's something about Enoch that you need to know. Genesis 5, 19 through 24, this is New Living Translation, says, after the birth of Enoch, Jared, his father, lived another 800 years, and he had other sons and daughters. Jared lived 962 years, and then he died. When Enoch was 65 years old, he became the father of Methuselah. After the birth of Methuselah, Enoch lived in close fellowship with God for another 300 years. Very important. Lived in close fellowship with God for 300 years. And he had other sons and daughters. Enoch lived 365 years walking in close fellowship with God. And then one day he disappeared because God took him. He made the hall of faith in six verses. <laughs> He's the most well-known man in, in the Bible for being taken up along with Elijah, the only two men that didn't have to taste death that were taken up alive. Enoch got to walk in close fellowship with God for 300 years, and he pleased him the whole time. God didn't even make him finish the race. He was doing so good. <laughs> God just came down there and scooped him on up. Okay, you're done. I would like to talk to this man and find out what it would be like to walk in that close of fellowship with God for 300 years, pleasing him the entire time. Pretty interesting fella. He made the hall of faith. So here's what it says in Hebrews 11 about him. It's Hebrews 11, 5 and 6. It was by faith that Enoch was taken up to heaven without dying. He disappeared because God took him. For before he was taken up, he was known as a person who pleased God. And it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must first believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. Now, we all know that Hebrews 11 verse. But we didn't know he's talking about Enoch when, when that verse was penned. Many people speculate as to why God took Enoch. I would say we need to be more concerned about what Enoch did that got him into the hall of faith so that we can imitate what he did because he pleased God for 300 years, walked with him in fellowship. Noah is the next man mentioned. Noah made the hall of faith. There's so much more about him than the other two. So for time's sake, I'm going to condense, hit the high points. But Noah was Enoch's great grandson. So in Genesis 5, 29 through 32, New Living, says Lamech named his son Noah, for he said, may he bring us relief from our work, and the painful labor of farming this ground that the Lord has cursed. After the birth of Noah, Lamech lived another 595 years, and he had other sons and daughters. But Lamech lived 777 years, and then he died. By the time Noah was 500 years old, he was the father of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. 
Now I'm going to read Genesis 6, but I'm just going to read 9 through 14, 17 and 18, and 21 and 22. This is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man. Listen to this. The only blameless person living on the earth at the time. And he walked in close fellowship with God. Noah was the father of three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now God saw that the earth had become corrupt and was filled with violence. God observed all this corruption in the world for everyone on earth. Everyone on earth was corrupt. So God said to Noah, I have decided to destroy all living creatures for they have filled the earth with violence. Yes, I will wipe them all out along with the earth. Build a large boat from cypress wood and waterproof it with tar inside and out. And then construct decks and stalls throughout the interior. Um, 17 and 18. Look, I'm about to cover the earth with a flood that will destroy every living thing that breathes. Everything on earth will die. But I will confirm my covenant with you. So enter the boat, you and your wife and your sons and their wives. Verse 21 and 22. And be sure to take on board enough food for your family and for all the animals. So Noah did everything exactly as God had commanded him. We need to make notes of these statements. <laughs> Noah did everything exactly as God commanded him. We need to practice listening and obeying everything that God has told us to do. There's other stories in the Bible where God has rescued the righteous before he's punished the wicked. And this is one of those stories. He was Noah was living in some crazy times. If you guys haven't read the beginning parts of Genesis, crazy times. And God had had enough. And Noah was considered the only righteous man alive at that point, pleasing the Lord in the midst of it all. We're living in crazy times. And there's a lot of people that are making their plumb line for truth. Government and what society dictates is... Uh, relative. You want to finish this race well. It is very important that you use the Bible as your plumb line for truth. That is the only way you're going to finish this race well. Because if, if you go with what our society is legalizing, you won't be pleasing the Lord. Genesis 7, I'm going to read 1, 6, 23, and 24. When everything was ready, the Lord said to Noah, Go into the boat with all of your family. For among all the people of the earth, I can see that you alone are righteous. Noah was 600 years old when the flood covered the earth. God wiped out every living thing on the earth, people, livestock, small animals that scurry along the ground, and the birds of the sky all were destroyed. The only people who survived were Noah and those with him on the boat, eight souls. Genesis 9, 28 and 29. Noah lived another 350 years after the great flood. He lived 950 years and then he died. So I'm going to jump into the New Testament. This is 2 Peter 2.5. God did not spare the ancient world except for Noah and the seven others in his family. Noah warned the world of God's righteous judgment. So God protected Noah when he destroyed the world of ungodly people with a vast flood. So now I'm jumping into Hebrews 11 where Noah is mentioned. This is what they noted him for. Hebrews 11, 7. It was by faith that Noah built a large boat to save his family from the flood. He obeyed God, who warned him about things that had never happened before. By his faith, Noah condemned the rest of the world, and he received the righteousness that comes by faith. So it was Noah listened, and Noah obeyed. He ran the race well, and he finished well. We were not going to live 950 years. But during the time that we live, we should really focus on what did these men do? They all listened. They put their faith in God, and they obeyed everything he said. So Abraham is the next man mentioned that made the hall of, hall of faith. And he was from the lineage of Noah's son, Shem. Um, he also put his actions behind his faith. So we're gonna, now we're going to learn a little about Abraham. In James 2, this is New Testament, James 2, 21 through 24, it says, Don't you remember that our ancestor Abraham was shown to be right with God by his actions when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see, his faith and his actions worked together. His actions made his faith complete. And so it happened, just as the scriptures say, Abraham believed God and God counted it to him as righteous because of his faith. 
He was even called the friend of God. So you see, we are shown to be right with God by what we do, not by faith alone. Now, I know a lot of people will argue that. They're like, oh, saved by grace, saved by grace, faith alone will save you. If you guys have been in my classes before, there is a Christian doctrine that has been around since the Bible, before the Bible, and it is called antinomianism. Anti in the Greek and uh, nomian is basically against law. So what this Christian doctrine teaches, if you look it up in the dictionary, it says antinomianism is a Christian doctrine that teaches that Christians are free from moral law, civil law, and scriptural law by God's gift of grace, and that salvation is attained solely through faith. Jesus calls that doctrine the Jezebel spirit in Revelation 2, and he tells the people that are practicing it, you better repent and stop teaching that, because if you don't, I'm going to throw you into a sickbed, and everybody that follows that false teaching is going to go with you, and they're going to all experience great tribulation unless they repent. It is not just faith in Christ. Yes, that is the foundation of it all. But after that, you cannot live a life of sin and expect to please God with it. And if you missed part two of Run Your Race, really take some notes on that one. James 4.17 says, remember it is sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. Move Josephus down. He's messing with my podium. I always word it like this, James 4, 17. If you know what is right in your heart to do and you choose not to do it, to you it's sin. If you know what's right to do, that's the Holy Spirit telling you. And if you choose not to listen to the Holy Spirit, you're blatantly disobeying him, then sin. So Abraham is called the father of our faith. He's called the father of many nations. And that's a huge honor in itself. But his story is chronicled from Genesis eleven twenty six all the way to Genesis 25, 8. So he got a lot more verses than per se Abel or Enoch. He got like chapters about his life. So during the time that Abraham was, his story was witnessed to in the Bible, he moved his family from the place that they knew and he took his son Lot with him. They went to an unfamiliar territory and they stayed there for years and um, grew vastly in their family, grew vastly in their wealth. And so that was one of the things that is talked about in Genesis 12, 1 through 4. It says, the Lord had said to Abram, so first it was Abram, then it got changed to Abraham, said to Abraham, leave your native country, your relatives, and your father's family, and go to the land that I'm going to show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make you famous, and, and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you, and I'm going to curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram departed as the Lord had instructed, and Lot, his nephew, went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he left Haran. So he survived numerous famines he, because he listened to the Lord, and he followed his instructions. That's why he survived. He became extremely wealthy because he listened to God's instructions, and he followed them. He saved his nephew Lot's life twice because he listened to God's instructions. God made a covenant with him to make him the father of many nations because he listened to God's instructions. He was willing to sacrifice his son Isaac, who through, the, through that son, God had promised to make him the father of many nations, that the descendants, all these descendants were going to come through this boy, and then he tells him to sacrifice him. Well, God didn't make him follow through with the sacrifice of Isaac, because Abraham followed his instructions. So he actually provided a ram, and we all know that story. So he followed God's instructions for a very, very long time. So when it talks about Abraham in Hebrews 11, the hall of faith, he gets, like, lots of verses. So I'm going to read um, Hebrews 11, 8 through 11, and then 17 through 19. It says, It was by faith that Abraham obeyed when God called him to leave home and go to another land that God would give him and as his inheritance. He went without knowing where he was going. And even when he reached the land God promised him, he lived there by faith. For he was like a foreigner living in tents. And so did Isaac and Jacob, who inherited the same promise. Abraham was confidently looking forward to a city with eternal foundations, a city designed and built by God. It was by faith that even Sarah was able to have a child, though she was barren and was too old. She believed that God would keep his promise. Now 17 through 19. 
It was by faith that Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice when God was testing him. Abraham, who had received God's promises, was ready to sacrifice his only son, Isaac, even though God had told him, Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted. Abraham reasoned that if Isaac died, God was able to bring him back to life again. And in a sense, Abraham did receive his son back from the dead. So I believe, many believe, that Abraham would deserve the MVP award <laughs> for being on this team in the Hall of Faith. Um, there were so many things chronicled about his life for us to follow. He started strong, and he finished strong. And we need to all remember that when we're running this race ourselves. Genesis 25, 7 and 8, uh, New Living Translation. Abraham lived for 175 years, and he died at a ripe old age. Having lived a long and satisfying life, he breathed his last and joined his ancestors in death. So the next person in the Hall of Faith is his son Isaac that was supposed to be sacrificed. Isaac was about 75 when Abraham died and left him everything. Isaac, um, a lot of his story is narrative. It's not like, it's just kind of telling the story of Isaac. There wasn't like a whole lot in his life that would be like huge life lessons. But he did, he did surrender to the Lord's will a bunch of times and obeyed him. And he survived some famines where the enemies were attacking. He stayed in the land when it would have made way more sense to leave. He went ahead and stayed there. And that was, you know, his obedience to God. When he was 40, he married his cousin because they did that back then. Um, they wanted to keep the bloodlines pure. I know a lot of people when I was teaching the Old Testament class are like, is that right? Like back then I was wanted the bloodline pure so they would marry within the family it out a little bit you know you weren't marrying your sisters but um anyway cousins cousins were okay so he married his cousin Rebecca and they had some they had twins so in Genesis 25 I'm going to read 25 26 and 28 the first one of the twins was very red at birth and covered with thick hair like a fur coat so they named him Esau and then the other twin was born with his hand grasping Esau's heel, so they named him Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when the twins were born. Verse 28, Isaac loved Esau because he enjoyed eating the wild game that Esau brought home. But Rebekah loved Jacob. So here's this rivalry started between the two, two twin brothers. So Hebrews 11, what did Isaac do that got him into the hall of faith? What did they, what did they chronicle? It says, it was by, this is Hebrews eleven twenty. It was by faith that Isaac promised blessings for the future of his sons, Jacob and Esau. And I'm like, that's what he got credit for? <laughs> like, surely would have thought something else would have made the Hall of Faith. He promised blessings for the future of his sons, Jacob and, e and Esau. Um, one of the things he did is he forgave his son, Jacob. Jacob, I don't, if, for all of you that know the story, the younger twin, stole, tricked Isaac, his dad, who was going blind, um, tricked him into giving him the firstborn's blessing, the birthright. He stole it, he stole Esau's blessing. And then Esau was so angry, he was going to kill him. And Mama Rebecca found out, her, overheard it, because Jacob was her favorite. She sends him up, back up to Haran, which is where Abraham was all those years that he moved to. And said, we're going to send him up there to find him a wife from the family, but really it was to save him from the wrath of Esau. So Jacob ends up staying up there for about 20 years, and he ends up marrying cousins that are sisters, uh, Rachel and Leah. And through Jacob, Rachel, Leah, and their two handmaidens, <laughs> Jacob has 12 boys. These 12 boys, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph, and Benjamin are the 12 tribes of Israel. So if you ever hear of the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 sons of Jacob, they're the same people. It's these 12 boys that Jacob had when he went up north to escape Esau. So while he's up there, God's just blessing him. And you would think, you know, he, he didn't do anything really good at the beginning. He did not start this race well. I mean, he's lying. <laughs> he's running. <laughs> But God sees the potential sometimes in us runners and sees the end from the beginning. 
and sees what we're going to bring forth at the end lets us stay in the race because he knows we're going to shape up. So later in the story with Jacob, God ends up wrestling with Jacob. And at this is the point where he changes his name to Israel, which means God prevails. Jacob means um, deceiver. So Jacob's name gets changed to Israel, and now there's a country named after him. So his life kind of shifted at that point. It's like a new chapter began for him. And so Jacob is, I mean, he made the hall of faith. But we're talking about Isaac here. Isaac, you're thinking, okay, so Isaac was the one that, I mean, he forgave Jacob, but he's, he should be noted for when he got, almost got sacrificed. And a lot of people don't understand this. When Isaac was with his dad, Abraham, and they took him up onto the mountain to sacrifice him, how many of you thought or have been told or in your imagination thought that Isaac was a little boy? Raise your hand if in your head you thought you, you picture a little boy being taken up the hill and then daddy lifts him up onto <laughs> the altar and dad's about ready to like bring the knife down on Isaac and Isaac is probably scared and crying but Abraham's being obedient. Well, when I study the Bible, I always study ancient Jewish historian Josephus. And what he has to say about that story, I was going to read it, but for time's sake, I'll just summarize it because he talks in very old English. He said that Isaac was grown. Isaac was around 25 years old. And when they went up that mountain, Isaac was carrying the wood. And when they got to the top and Abraham said, oh, my son, this is going to happen. You see, God's not going to take you out of this world by normal means either through disease or war or some, you know, or whatever. He's going to receive you unto himself with prayers and offerings of a sacrifice from me because you're special. Um, he gave you to me when I didn't think I was ever going to get you. And so if he requires you from me, then it far be it from me to tell him no. Now he's promised that the descendants are going to come through you, but I reckon that, like he said, if, if he takes you, he can also raise you back. And here's what Isaac says to his dad, per Josephus. He says, I know that, that you have prayed for me. I know that I am like your son. I know how much I mean to you. But you mean so much to me that even if God didn't require it, if it were only you, that wanted me to lay down in the altar, I would gladly go. And Isaac, it says, he went straight to the altar and got up on it. He did it himself. He was willing to lay down his life out of reverence and respect for his father. And that's what Christ did. So he's almost like, you know, it's a, a symbolic representation of what our Savior did for us. I think he made the Hall of Fame just from that alone, just laying up there and saying, I love you, Dad, whatever. If, if you want me to do this, I, I'm going to do it out of obedience to you. I'll lay down my life for you. So Isaac's son, Jacob, we already kind of talked about him. He's the next one that made the Hall of Faith. And I'm like, he was so bad at first. But like I said, he finished well, even though he, he deceived his daddy. So through Israel, God reconfirmed the covenant that he made with his father, Isaac. And he made with his grandfather, Abraham. So despite his faults, despite Jacob's faults, God chose him to be the leader of a great nation. So even though his life isn't filled with wisdom, Jacob's life is not filled with bravery. He made the hall of faith. And it just, I, I think kind of just goes to show us that even though we're not used in some like grand scheme in the spotlight all the time, or we may not have the most shining um, track record, that God can turn it all around. And in the end, it is how you finish. So here's what, it, here's what Hebrews 11.21 says about Jacob. It says, It is by faith that Jacob, when he was old and dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and bowed in worship as he leaned on his staff. Okay, if you remember what Jacob did to his dad, Isaac, when he tricked him into stealing the birthright of the firstborn, he's the secondborn. 
Isaac forgave him for that. And I think Isaac saw the bigger picture that, you know, God had a plan. But that was not the custom. You did not give the second-born child the firstborn's blessing. So here's what um, Jacob does. When he's old, he blessed each of Joseph's sons. Well, Joseph was son number 11. Out of his 12, Joseph was son number 11, but he was the first son that Rachel had, and Rachel was his favorite wife. And God had opened her womb finally after 10 children from the handmaids and Leah. Rachel finally gets to have a baby. It's Joseph. Joseph ends up having two children, and later when, when Jacob is dying, instead of blessing the firstborn, he flip-flops his hands. He voluntarily, purposefully gives the younger one the firstborn's blessing, where he tricked his dad to do it. He actually just did it. I thought that was just kind of a very ironic thing that he did. So I personally would give Jacob the, mo the um, most improved player. <laughs> Because he started out really poorly, he ended well. He finished well. And that's what this teaching is about, is how are you going to finish this race that we're in? Don't give up, even though you might be battling age, ailments, floundering for your purpose. Finish well. And there's different things that you can do to finish well this race that we are in. So out of Jacob's 12 kiddos, only one makes the Hall of Faith, and it is Joseph. So we're going to get a little bit of information on Joseph now. Uh, Genesis 30, 22 and 23, this is New Living, it says, Then God remembered Rachel's plight, answered her prayers by enabling her to have children. She became pregnant and she gave birth to a son. And God has, she said, God has removed my disgrace. Because back then, if you couldn't have babies, it was a very disgraceful thing for a woman uh, if you were barren. And so after 10 children came through, Abraham's uh, wife, Leah, and handmaids, Rachel finally gets to have a baby. And so jo Joseph means Jehovah has added. So that's why she named her baby that. In his story, Joseph's story spans Genesis 37 all the way to Genesis 50. So he gets chapters and chapters written about him. So I'm going to hit the highlights on why Joseph made the Hall of Faith. When he was born, you don't hear anything really about him until he's 17 years old. He's out in the fields with his older brothers, and he comes back home. They're all shepherding. He comes home, and he starts basically telling dad, <laughs> narking. And um, so the brothers aren't really happy with that. Well, because also he was Rachel's first baby, and Rachel was the chosen wife. Uh, Daddy Jacob made um, Joseph a coat of many colors and expressed how much he loved him, which further ticked off the brothers. Well, then to make matters worse, Joseph starts having dreams that his brothers are going to one day bow down to him. So the brothers have had enough. So the next time Joseph comes out into the fields, they throw him in a pit. They were going to kill him, but they didn't. And they sold him to some Midianite travelers, and they took him to Egypt, and they sold him to a high-ranking official named Potiphar. The brothers tore up his coat of many colors, splattered it with blood, and told Dad that your favorite son has just been killed. And of course, so he went into mourning. Well, meanwhile, down in Egypt, Joseph is getting favor with Potiphar. And then Potiphar's wife gets a liking to Joseph and starts making the moves on him. And he rejects her. And she's so angry that she tells Potiphar that he tried to defile her. So Potiphar naturally puts Joseph, who was his right-hand man, in prison. And he's there for like two years unfairly but God gives him favor with the prison guards God gives him favor with the prisoners and he gives them the ability to interpret dreams so while Joseph is down there he starts interpreting some of the prisoners dreams and when they get released he says to the one of them make sure when you get reinstated in your position with with the Pharaoh that you remember me you tell him that I'm here unfairly and he totally forgot so Pharaoh has a dream later on down the road that he can't remember or figure out what it, what it means. And so he's got all these magicians, and none of them can figure out what's going on. And this one guy that got reinstated in his position said, wait a minute, wait a minute. I was in prison with a guy that can do this. So they pulled Joseph out of prison. Not only does he tell Pharaoh what his dream was, he tells him what it means. And he says, in seven years, you're going to have seven years of good, and then you're going to have seven years of famine that's going to wipe this country out. 
So Pharaoh says, okay, I'm putting you second in command of all of Egypt, and your job is to make sure that we store enough grain in these next seven years that when the famine hits, we're going to be able to supply food for our country and for countries around us. So Joseph gets bumped up into second command of Egypt, and he does what he's supposed to do. Well, when this famine hits, it hits all the way up to the land of Canaan where his family, his brothers are. And they're all starving. And so through a series of events, the brothers come down to get grain. And they don't recognize Joseph, but he recognizes them and he forgives them. And so I want to read to you what he says to them. It says in Genesis 45, 4 through 5, he says, please come closer, he said to them. So they came closer. And he said again, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into slavery in Egypt. But don't be upset and don't be angry with yourselves for selling me to this place. It was God who sent me here ahead of you to preserve your lives. He had been through a lot, but he saw God's plan. And I don't know how many of you have ever gone through a really, really, really hard time in your life and in the midst of it, you don't really understand why, but you know that God's got you and you know that there's got to be a light at the end of this tunnel. You just don't know when it's going to show up. But when you're through it and you look back, you're like, oh, yeah, I can totally see the hand of God. That would have been great if I could have seen it the whole time I was in the storm. Could have gotten through it with a lot more grace. But Joseph, he's like, I saw it. I know that this is why God sent me here. He goes, you guys didn't do this to me. God did this to me because he wanted me to save millions of people's lives. Genesis 45, 7 through 8. God has sent me ahead of you to keep you and your families alive and to preserve many survivors. So it was God who sent me here, not you. And he's the one who made me an advisor to Pharaoh, the manager of his entire palace, and the governor of all of Egypt. So Joseph's faith in God during the trials and the tribulations earned him a spot in the hall of faith. He started out proud and overconfident. Oh. He ended up faithful, humble, uh, obedient, to the Lord and forgiving. So he ended up in the hall of faith. So what he ends up doing is he takes his whole family, all of his brothers, um, his daddy still a lot, moves them all down to Egypt so that he can totally take care of them. Hebrews 11.22, this is what's chronicled about him. It was by faith that Joseph, when he was about to die, said confidently that the people of Israel would leave Egypt. And he's moved them all down there, and they've been living there, but he said confidently, you all are going to end up leaving Egypt one day. He even commanded them to take his bones with them when they left. Well, Joseph's entire family and their descendants ended up staying there for years and years and years, like 400 years. But the Pharaoh that had all this love for Joseph, he's long gone. The new Pharaohs that are coming into control don't have any ties to Joseph don't have any loyalty to the Hebrews. In fact, the Hebrews are starting to outnumber them because God's blessing the Hebrews. So the new Pharaoh enslaves the Hebrew people, deslaves Joseph's descendants, and demands that the midwives kill all the male babies that are born for population control so that the Egyptians can catch up with the Hebrew people. So we're looking at years and years and years, like 400 years later before we see the next Hall of Faith or show up, and it's Moses who was a baby born in Egypt from the Hebrew people. And this Pharaoh tried to have him killed, but the mama put him in that little basket with tar, sent him down the Nile to where the Pharaoh's daughter bays. She sees him and raises him as her own. So Hebrews 11, this is the Hebrews part about Moses. Hebrews 11, 23 through 29. It was by faith that Moses' parents hid him for three months when he was born. They saw that God had given them an unusual child, and they were not afraid to disobey the king's commands. It was by faith that Moses, when he grew up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to share the oppression of God's people instead of enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin. He thought it was better to suffer for the sake of Christ than to own the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking ahead to his great reward. It was by faith that Moses left the land of Egypt not fearing the king's anger. He kept right on going because he kept his eyes on the one who is invisible. It was by faith that Moses commanded the people of Israel to keep the Passover and to sprinkle blood on the doorposts so that the angel of death would not kill their firstborn sons. 
It was by faith that the people of Israel went right through the Red Sea as though they were on dry ground. But when the Egyptians tried to follow, they were all drowned. We all know these stories. There's so much written about Moses in the Bible, but that was his Hebrews 11, what was chronicled about him, why he made the hall of faith. He did so many things. God spoke to him in a burning bush, tells him, go back into Egypt that you just left, and I want you to free all your people. So he goes back there. He does the, the, <laughs> the 10 plague things <laughs> with God's help, and he ends up leading the people out into freedom. They get caught at the Red Sea. God splits the Red Sea. He leads them across the Red Sea. Then they go into the land of Midian. They end up at Mount Sinai. He goes up on the mountain. He's talking to God. He talks to God for these people. There's millions of Hebrew people now in the wilderness. He gets the Ten Commandments. He gets the Mosaic Law, which is the moral, the civil, the ceremonial rules, everything to keep these people in check during their wilderness experience. He, he gets them all, gets all those things taken care of. Um, he leads them into the the. 40 years of the wilderness experience. But during that time, he helps construct the tabernacle, the portable tabernacle with all the utensils, the brazen altars, the altar of incense, the menorah, the table of showbread, the Ark of the Covenant. So he, he's over all of that. He appoints the priests. He appoints judges. He enforces the laws. He talks to God on their behalf. He writes the first five books of the Bible, you know, in his spare time. He tells everybody where they're supposed to camp, how they're supposed to move with God's presence. I mean, this man had so much responsibility, 40 years putting up with their rebellion and their whining and their complaining. And then he finally gets to where he can see the promised land. And uh, Deuteronomy 34, 4 through 7, then the Lord said to Moses, this is the land I promised an oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob when I said, I will give it to your descendants. I have now allowed you to see it with your own eyes, but you will not enter the land. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, just as the Lord had said. But this part, a lot of people don't catch this part. Verse 6, the Lord buried him. The Lord buried him in the valley near Beth Peor in Moab. But to this day, no one knows the exact place. Moses was 120 years old when he died, yet his eyesight was clear, and he was as strong as ever. And a lot of people were like, oh, so unfair. Moses, he did all of that. He got called when he was 80. It was like 40 years later, man's 120. All that he did so that they could see the promised land, and God's not going to let him go in. He got a much better promised land. Because if you guys know what happened after they went over the, the Jordan River, <laughs> it was just, it was Jericho. And then it was just mass wars and work and slaughters. And I'm like, he just, it's almost like he said, all right, you did the hard part. Now I'm going to bury you in a secret place. I'm going to take you into my promised land. Your job's over. You did good. So, I mean, I think he gets the team captain award. He didn't go into the earthly promised land, but I think he, he got one better. So he started well. He finished well. He deserves to be in the hall of faith. Um, his story is absolutely amazing. So now I'm going to start reading in Hebrews 11. I'm going to read 30 through 40. It was by faith that the people of Israel marched around Jericho for seven days, and the walls came crashing down. It was by faith that Rahab the prostitute was not destroyed with the people in her city who refused to obey God, for she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. How much more do I need to say? It would take too long to recount the stories of faith of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and all the prophets. By faith, these people, here's your great cloud of witnesses, by faith, these people overthrew kingdoms, ruled with justice, and received what God had promised them. They shut the mouths of lions, quenched the flames of fire, and escaped death by the edge of the sword. Their weakness was turned to strength. They became strong in battle and put whole armies to flight. Women received their loved ones back again from death, but others were tortured, refusing to turn from God in order to be set free. They placed their hope in a better life after the resurrection. Some were jeered at and their backs were cut open with whips. Others were chained in prison. Some died by stoning. Some were sawed in half and others were killed with the sword. 
someone about wearing skins of sheep and goats, destitute and oppressed and mistreated. They were too good for this world, wandering over deserts, deserts and mountains, hiding in caves and holes in the ground. All these people, all these people, your great cloud of witnesses, earned a good reputation because of their faith, yet none of them received all that God had promised. For God had something better in mind for us so that they would not reach perfection without us. So these are your great cloud of witnesses, these men that are listed in Hebrews 11. Their witness is what was chronicled. That's, that's what witness means. It doesn't mean that they're even up there staring down at us. That's not what that phraseology means. It means what they did was so noteworthy that it was witnessed to in our scriptures. Gideon was the next one mentioned that made the hall of faith. His story is pretty funny. I'm going to teach you something tonight that maybe some of you know and maybe some of you don't know. But he is in Judges 6 through 8, and I've only got him and one other little one, and then we're going to be done. So I know it's a lot of story time tonight. So the, the Israelites kept doing this thing where they would trust in God and worship God for a while, and then for whatever reason, they would start worshiping false gods again. So we're in that period of time where they're worshiping false gods. And... So the Lord turns them over to the Midianites, and the Midianites are like locusts, and they keep coming in at different times of the year, and they're just ransacking their crops and their animals and their people. And so God comes to, sends an angel of the Lord, comes to Gideon while he's hiding in the threshing cellar. <laughs> and he says, I want you to, to make war against these Midianites. And he's like, okay, I'm going to need a little confirmation on that. I don't know how many of you have ever been told by God to do something that's out of the box. And you're like, um, just let me, uh, let me pray about that. Give me a confirmation. That's where this story, that's where that practice comes from is this story where you're like laying out the, the fleece. We call it laying out the fleece. The story is where that comes from. So he's told, yes, I'm going to confirm you are to go against these Midianite people. But first, I want you to destroy your father's false idols, the Baal and the Asherah. Tear them down. So he's scared because he knows the people are worshiping these false idols, and he knows they're his dad, so he waits till nighttime. Tears them down. Well, the people know who did it. So they want him dead until the Midianites and the Amalekites set up camp in the Jezreel Valley to attack them. And all of a sudden, they're not really focused on Gideon anymore. So Gideon gather some of the tribes together. And he's like, okay, God wants us to go to war with these guys. And so I need all of you to come and help. So he gets 32,000 men together. And God says, you have too many. And he's like, no, I don't. I do not have enough. He's like, no, you have too many. So we're going to weed them out. So test number one, you just tell the ones that are scared, go home. And so Gideon's like, all right. So he makes the announcement, out of 32,000 men, 22,000 leave. He's got 10,000 guys left. And this is what God says in Judges 7, 4 through 7. This is NIV. But the Lord said to Gideon, there are still too many men. Take them down to the water, and I will thin them out for you. If I say, this one shall go with you, then he shall go. But if I say, this one shall not go with you, he shall not go. So Gideon took the men down to the water. There the Lord told him, separate those who lap the water with their tongues as a dog laps, from those who kneel down and drink. And I'm going to tell you what those two phraseologies actually mean because some people get that confused. 300 of them drank with cupped hands, lapping like the dog. So when it says the ones lapped like a dog, they weren't lapping from the river. They were lapping from cupped hands. And that's important to remember. All the rest got down on their knees to drink. They drank straight from the river. The Lord said to Gideon, with the 300 men that lapped, like this, uh, with the 300 men that lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hands. Let all the others go home. So out of the 10,000 men, 300 of them scooped the water up from the river and licked it out of their hands. Okay. Um, how many of you have ever heard that Gideon got the 300 bravest men, raise your hand. If they got the 300 bravest men were the ones that lapped water. All right. I was told that the 300 bravest were the ones that did that. And here's why I was told they were the best soldiers. Because they were smart. When they picked the water up, 
they were always aware of their surroundings. So they were drinking the water, always making sure that was the good warriors, right? The stupid warriors were the ones that just go fling their face down in the water and expose their backs to the enemy arrows. <laughs> it's like, you can't see nobody sneaking up on you. You got your face in the water. You dumb. So I was always told that he got the smart warriors because they were the ones that were aware of their surroundings. And yeah, until I read Josephus. And here's what Josephus has to say on this for those of you. The ones that lapped water like a dog out of their hands. This is what it says. Everyone that lapped, lapped the water with his tongue says, it's from Josephus, Gideon led them down to the spring in the fiercest heat of the noonday, and that he judged those to be the bravest who flung themselves down and drank. The bravest were the ones who put their face straight into the water. But those to be cowards who lapped the water hastily and tumultuously out of their hands. Um, Theodoret also thinks that the divine aid was shown by the fact that the greatest cowards were chosen. And then the phraseology, as a dog lappeth, it says some commentators fancy that this is an allusion to the Egyptian dogs who, out of fear for the Nile crocodiles, only venture to lap the water while they're running along the banks. Like, too scared. <laughs> run, run, run. <laughs> so the people that lapped the water did it because they were scared. They didn't do it because they were smart. They did it because they were scared. The guys that were brave were the ones that put their face straight into the water. And so God not only wanted to eliminate the number of soldiers that Gideon got to take, um, it, to ensure that Gideon didn't take any of the glory, he sent him with the 300 biggest sissies <laughs> of the group and ended up defeating the Midianites. And so the people no longer want to kill Gideon. They want to make him their king. And he says, no, I'm not going to be your king, and neither are my children. God's going to be your king. So Gideon ends up making the hall of faith because he put his faith in God, and he followed it up with obedience, even though it looked like he was going to get destroyed with 300 sissies. God ended up <laughs> giving him the glory. And then ironically, Barak and Deborah. Barak is the next one listed in the hall of faith. He's the last one to go with. Um, him and Deborah took 10,000 men into battle against the Canaanites who had them paying taxes for the past 20 years. The odds were completely against them. But God brings this, if you ever read that story, God brings this supernatural storm from heaven. But even though these guys are all in the same place fighting, the storm is only affecting the Canaanites. It's not affecting the Hebrew people at all. So they end up defeating the Canaanites with God's help. So time doesn't permit for me to tell of Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel. But what is important to know is that although some of them may not have started well, these men all finished well enough to make the Hall of Faith of Hebrews chapter 11. And we need to listen to their examples of faith, not only faith, but faith followed up with actions and obedience. So he's a loving God. He wants that none should perish. So if you think that you've sinned too much or if you've just blown too much of your life and he doesn't want you in the race anymore, you would be wrong. He wants all of us in the race because he sees the end from the beginning. He wants all of us to finish well. So as long as there's breath in your body, never, 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 never too late to get back in the race and figure out something that you can be passionate about, something that you can do for the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. So next week... Next week, we're going to go into receiving your rewards. So now that we've finished the race well, we're going to finish the race well. For those of you who want to know what that award ceremony looks like when we stand before the Lord at the Bama seat or the judgment seat of Christ, do not miss next week. It's going to be an eye-opener for some of you.